Hello, everyone. I'm so thankful that you're able to join me again for Rejoice in the Lord. This is Positive Christian Living, and as we study through the book of Philippians. You know, so far in this letter to the Philippian church, Paul has given them several blessings. He's given them news regarding his personal status as he awaits trial in, in Rome, uh, and he has given them news that he plans to revisit them when he's freed from prison, which he thinks is going to happen pretty soon. Now, in the meantime, he compliments them for their faithfulness and for their generosity, and he encourages them to keep pursuing that positive Christian life. Paul proceeds to describe five examples of what positive Christian living looks like. Today, we'll cover number four. So far, what we've seen is that positive Christians seek to stand firm in the Lord and in the faith, even in when their faith is uh, being challenged or uh, is, uh, is it's difficult uh, when there's trials or when there's attacks or temptations, that positive Christian seeks to stand firm. Number two, we've seen that positive Christians seek to imitate Christ and not those of the world. They are to be Christ-like. He says, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and he's telling them to be humble, to, to seek out for the interest of others and not the interest of, their, of themselves. Number three, he's told them that positive Christians seek to rejoice during those trials, knowing that the victory awaits them and that the trials are just tests of their faith. In this chapter, chapter three, we'll examine this fourth example of what positive Christian living looks like. That is the fact that positive Christians seek righteousness by faith not by works. Today, we're just going to cover the first eight verses of the text of chapter 3, and it begins with an exhortation. In verse 1, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Paul is going to give them this warning starting in verse 2. But first, he prefaces this warning with an exhortation to rejoice in the Lord. You see, this should be the standard go-to position for positive Christians. If I'm going to face whatever situation, whatever condition, my response to that situation or condition is to rejoice. Now, it's easy for us to rejoice when things are going great, when, when there's things to be uh, praised or things to be uh, encouraging to us. Well, it's easy to rejoice in those things. It's difficult, I think, from my own personal experience, to rejoice in times of trials, in times where I'm challenged, in times where my faith may be wavering. That's difficult. In difficult times when I may be tempted or other people may attack me, that's difficult. That's a difficult time to rejoice. But still again, the positive Christian has a, 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 a bigger picture in mind. They realize that even when I'm going through those difficult times, even when I'm being challenged or even those times where I'm um, uh, under trial, I'm going to rejoice knowing that 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 uh, when I go through that trial or go through that challenge, I'm going to be a better Christian in the long run. I'm going to grow from it. And so what does the Christian do? The positive Christian rejoices in the Lord no matter what situation or condition is around them. Now, he assures them, that uh, Paul does, he assures the Philippians that he's not troubled in repeating this warning. Now, I think he's talking about repeating the warning to them. Sometimes you could read this verse and say, well, he's talking about writing the same things to them is no trouble to him. He doesn't mind telling them to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice. And he does that in this text. But I think that this is referring to the fact that he's about to give them this warning that he has probably given to them before. He is confident that in doing so, in giving them this warning once more, all over again, he is guarding their souls. He is protecting them and helping them get through that trial and fight off those errors that are taught by false teachers who are creeping into the church and causing all kinds of trouble. Very much the same way that we have to deal with false teachers today. And so we can read this warning and say, well, this is what we need to do as well. Now, these false teachers that Paul is talking about are referred to as Judaizers, and they would often follow Paul wherever he went. 
and they promoted the idea that you had to become a Jew by circumcision first before you could become a Christian and thus be saved. This stems all the way back to Acts chapter 15, where this confrontation begins, where Jews were saying, in order for you to become a Christian, then you would have to become a Jew by circumcision first. Now, even as he writes this epistle of joy to the Philippians, encouraging the brethren to rejoice in the Lord, he finds it necessary to warn them of these false teachers. And so he gives them this warning. He's given them this exhortation to rejoice. Now he gives them a warning of the enemy. Let's look at verses 2 through 3. First of all, he says in verse 2, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now, it's, I think it's very in, important to notice that Paul gets right down to the point, And he says, Beware of dogs. Now, to refer to someone as a dog, it's a serious insult. Even in our day-to-day, it's offensive to call someone a dog uh, in a derogatory uh, fashion. And even in those days, in the ancient times, in Paul's time, it's maybe even more so of an insult. You know, dogs at this time were kept outside. They were not pets. They didn't come crawl up on your lap and snore, you know, while you're watching television. No, dogs were kept outside, and they wandered around aimlessly in packs and basically were just scavengers, perhaps maybe in the same way that we might view a raccoon or some other kind of varmint that gets into our trash. Now, Jews would refer to Gentiles as dogs uh, in a derogatory sense. And so Paul is saying, beware of dogs, beware of those who are scavengers, beware of those who rummage through the trash, beware of the varmints. And he gets right to the point again and doubles down and says, beware of evil workers. He further explains who these people are. You know, they, these uh, false teachers, they, they worked hard in activities and the result of those activities would result in the falling away of believers and because they insisted that Christians be circumcised in order to be saved. And their thinking was that Christianity was just a part of Judaism. Therefore, if a Gentile wanted to become a Christian, he first had to submit to the Jewish Uh, laws and and regulations, uh, including laws about food and and other requirements, uh, laws about sacrifice. But the, the, the main demand was that they had to be circumcised. Now, let's talk about these two circumcisions that he talks about. In verses, uh, th- starting in verse three, he says, "For we are the true circumcision." Now he's just said a moment ago in verse two, "Beware of the false circumcision." So, in order to understand what that is, let's talk about what the true circumcision is. So, verse three says, "For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh." Okay, so that's very important because he's going to expound upon what that is here in just a moment. So in verses 2 through 3, we find Paul making a play on words. First of all, he calls the Judaizers the false circumcision. And the word that's used here is katatome, which basically means mutilation. Very much different than the kind of circumcision that he's going to use Uh, the word that he's going to use here in just a moment. Because when he refers to true Christians or the true uh, circumcision, he uses a different word, paratome. And so the idea is that there's a difference. The katatome is mutilation. Paratome is true circumcision. Circumcision was an ancient practice among the Jews. It began with Abraham, and it signified that, that that individual was included in the covenant relationship between God and the Jewish people. All Jewish boys were to be circumcised on the eighth day after their birth. Circumcision, very much like animal sacrifice, was a preview of things to come in Christianity. Let's look at sacrifices for just a moment. Sacrifices of the temple previewed a time when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would sacrifice himself for the sins of all men. Now, 
physical circumcision performed on the body was a sign of one's willingness to obey God and become one of his chosen people. And this was a preview of a time when God's people would be regenerated by God's Holy Spirit from within and be circumcised spiritually, specifically of the heart. Now, we have to also remember, and it's important to, to uh, bring to mind, that this, um, this was a preview of a time when God's people would be re regenerated uh, by the Holy Spirit, that physical circumcision would no longer be needed for religious purposes. Okay, so we have to realize that that it once once the the preview is over and the real thing is there, we don't need the preview anymore. I can watch the entire thing. It's like trying to watch a movie. Think about it. If it's a movie and you watch the preview and then you watch the actual movie, it's weird to go back and just see the preview of it. You want to just watch the entire thing. You want the real thing. Well, that's the way that circumcision was. It was leading up to the real thing. And even in the Old Testament, the prophets sp spoke of what God really wanted. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, and Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, also in Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4, there's this phrase, the circumcision of the heart. That's the real thing. Okay, so we have the preview, circumcision of the flesh, and then we have the real thing, the circumcision of the heart. And Paul, if you remember, told the, the Romans that physical circumcision was no longer needed. It had no spiritual benefits. We can read that in Romans chapter 2 and verse 25 through 29. In Colossians, and Paul talks about it even more, and he explains that the relationship between Christian baptism and and Jewish circumcision, circumcision is, re, is it's related. So here's what he says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, skip down to verse 11. Says, and in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. So if it's a circumcision that was made without hands, then it's not fleshly circumcision. It must be spiritual circumcision. Well, he talks more about it. He says, in the removal of the body of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So it is through baptism that Christ himself performs a spiritual circumcision on the believer. What is removed at baptism is not a small symbolic piece of flesh, as in physical circumcision, but Christ removes the entire body of sin. This is why physical circumcision is not required. It's inferior. It's just the preview, and it does not serve the purpose of the removal of sin. So Paul declares in Philippians, we go back to our text this morning, he declares that true circumcision are those who, what does he say? Worship God in spirit. Glory in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's very important because circumcision, as understood then and really honestly now, is a fleshly uh, circumcision. But here he says the true circumcision has nothing to do with the flesh. Paul then uses himself as an example by explicitly defining what it means to have no confidence in the flesh. And he does this with two different categories. First, he talks about it in the racial category, and then he'll talk about it as in the religious category. So let's talk about this, this explanation of the confidence uh, in the flesh. Look at verses four through six with me. He says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, 
a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. You see, what Paul is saying is that is that if there is anyone who could have confidence in the flesh racially, it would have been somebody like Paul. Why? He says, because I was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, what Paul is telling us is that he was a genuine Jew from birth. Unlike some of the Judaizers or their followers who were circumcised as converts or as adults, which really was the case for the Gentile Christians who were being seduced by the false teachers. See, Paul was circumcised on the eighth day after birth, according to law. Paul was no proselyte. So he could have confidence in the flesh, but he's saying, I don't, I don't. But if there is somebody that could, it would be me. Why? Because I've been circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law. Then he says he is of the nation of Israel. In other words, he is directly descended from Jacob. Arabs would be descended from Abraham. Edomites would be descended from Isaac. But Jews specifically would be descended from Jacob. And, and Paul saying, hey, I am a, of the nation of Israel, not just descendants of Abraham. Because, you know, those, the, even the Edomites would go back to Isaac. Even the Arabs could go trace their lineage back to Abraham. But Jews specifically to Jacob, because Jacob changed his name to Israel, right? So he is of the tribe of Benjamin. Another reason, if he's going to have confidence in the flesh, which he could, not only is of the nation of Israel, but he is of the tribe of Benjamin. So he could trace his lineage all the way back to the two tribes that made up the southern kingdom of Judah. There were 10 northern tribes that were destroyed and they were scattered about, but, but that southern kingdom, it remained intact, even though it was attacked and it was exiled in, in Babylon in, in 589 BC, there was still this remnant and eventually they returned to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and repopulate the land. So being from the southern kingdom was a mark of pride as a true Jew with an unbroken historical lineage. That's who Paul is. He says, if there's anybody that can have confidence in the flesh racially, it's me. Not only because I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm also, what does he say? A Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, Paul is saying, both of my parents were Jews. I am a pure-blooded Jew. There were no marriages with non-Jews on either side of his family, all the way back to his ancestor of Benjamin. Now, Paul could have confidence in the flesh racially, but he says, I, I'm not going to have that kind of confidence in the flesh. Why? Because true circumcision has no confidence in the flesh. Now, the second category, if there was anyone who could have confidence in the flesh religiously, it would have been someone like Paul. Why? Because he says, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. You see, according to the law, the highest positions in society were occupied by the Jewish priest, which would have been decided by your family lineage, but also the Pharisees, who were lawyers that, that uh, taught and interpreted the law. And they were the strictest and most conservative religious group within Judaism. So Paul says, listen, if there's anybody that can have confidence in the flesh religiously, it would be me. Why? Because I am a Pharisee as to the law. But also, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. If you're to measure zeal for the law, then the most enthusiastic and extreme was, was Paul, was really Saul of Tarsus, who went around and actually imprisoned other Jews that he believed were violating the law by following Jesus Christ. It's interesting, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, it says that Paul was breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. His whole life, every breath 
he took was devoted to persecuting Christians, murdering them. And he would go around and even murder Jews who had converted over to Christianity. So that's pretty zealous. And so Paul says, if, if you're going to look at zeal, if you're going to look at zeal religiously, man, I, I was dedicated. I was a persecutor of the church. Now he says, as to righteousness, he was blameless. So if there's anybody that can have confidence in the flesh religiously and look at righteousness, he says, I'm blameless. Now, not that Paul was perfect. I'm sure he had his own mistakes, but he was diligent in fulfilling all of the requirements of the law. You see, somebody who is righteous seeks to go through, even when they have mistakes, go through those mistakes to make themselves right with God. That's what a righteous person is. Abraham was counted as righteous by his faith. Did Abraham have mistakes? Absolutely he did. But he was righteous because he always was seeking to please and serve God. So we too can be righteous. Not that we're perfect, but we can be righteous before God because we're seeking to be righteous. Therefore, we're blameless. Now, let's look at the next part of this section, verses 7 through 8. We've already seen that Paul... Uh, doesn't have the confidence in the flesh because that's just not what the uh, people of the true circumcision are going to have. Now, verses 7 through 8, he goes on to say, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. All these things, which could have given Paul high honor, high prestige, and high social standing, Paul says, I count them as loss. These are things that are fleshly, racially and religiously. It's just of the flesh. And people that are of the true circumcision uh, have no confidence in the flesh. As a matter of fact, Paul lost a lot of those things uh, that he could have had confidence in when he chose to follow Christ. But when you compare the value of knowing Christ, these things to Paul were nothing more than rubbish. Uh, literally, the King James says, dung. It's trash. It's waste. It's manure. And Paul says, I don't want anything to do with it. I, all those things are trash. As long as I know Jesus, that's really what's important. I want to know him. Now, it's important to know that it's not about just knowing who Jesus is or knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus in a relationship, intimately understanding who Jesus is and the impact he has on your life, and your need for him in your life. So let's ask these questions in application. Do we place confidence in our fleshly accomplishments in our life? You see, if we start thinking back and, and looking at uh, maybe our racial background or even our religious heritage, and we start taking pride in those things, well, that's just putting confidence in the flesh. And if we're going to be a part of the true circumcision, then we're going to not count those things as anything but just trash, rubbish, dung, manure. All right? And remember, it's important to realize that this circumcision is a circumcision of the heart, the removal of sin from our body when we are baptized into Christ Jesus. And so we put those things away from us, the sin, and we live our lives according to the true circumcision. Everything else is rubbish. What's really important is having this relationship with Jesus. I hope that we consider all those things of the flesh as trash, as manure, as rubbish, compared to knowing Jesus. And I'm talking about really knowing Him. Everything else is manure. 
Now, next time when we look at, continue on in the text, we're going to find that righteousness comes from knowing Christ through faith. He set this all up for us to see that righteousness comes from faith when we know Jesus. And we're going to talk about what it means to know him. And we're going to talk about what it means to gain Christ. Thank you so much for joining me today. God bless you.